the stock market is priced for an unremittent economic boom. So there you have it. Uh, will a recession upset the apple cart? Of course it will. Hello, everyone. Our guest, Dave Rosenberg, talks about why the recession is still on horizon despite market strength, whether we're in a new economy, whether the FED are taking the right action, unwinding of private credit markets, which assets to perform, and more. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. We have uh, discrepancies and dichotomies uh, uh, in the data that I have not seen in my 40 years in this business. Uh, we, I mean, we have, for example, 3.1% uh, growth year over year in real GDP. And of course, that gets all the uh, attention. Uh, but there's been no growth in the past year in real gross domestic income. Uh, the gap between the spending accounts, which is what GDP is, and the income accounts uh, has never been this wide before. Uh, we've had no growth at all in the past year in industrial production. And uh, while you can argue that uh, non-farm payrolls have remained robust, of course, every single month of non-farm payrolls, the previous month is being revised lower. But we have 1.8% um, growth in non-farm payrolls, but only 0.4% growth in the household survey. Uh, that's equivalent uh, in terms of differential of almost 2 million jobs. Uh, so I would just submit uh, to the viewers that if the payroll survey looked like the household survey and the household survey is running flat and, and all the jobs in the past year in that survey has all been part-time. Uh, but if you were going to replace the payroll survey with household survey and you're going to replace GDP with GDI, uh, you'd come to a different conclusion about the shape of the U.S. economy right now. Yeah, it makes sense. Is, is there a potential that I guess if we look back at 2008 post post that, uh, uh, you know, post the crash, it seemed like there was sort of a new economy or it was a new way to look at uh, how the economy works with, with QE, etc. Do you think there's something similar maybe that's occurred over the past few years where maybe some of our other indicators, uh, as you said, aren't showing exactly what's happening in the economy? Look, the, the economy uh, is always evolving. So, you know, I don't think that is any different than all the talk about uh, some new economy after we get out of the real estate mess in the early to mid 80s. Is it different than coming out of the tech wreck and mopping up all that excess capacity back in the uh, early to mid 2000s, uh, you know, post uh, great financial crisis, uh, of course, you know, uh, different sort of economy it, it, it's always changing so that argument doesn't impress me so much what 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 we have to try and grapple with is why do we have such a big divide especially in the national accounts uh production in the past year is flat uh, i don't know what sort of new economy that is uh and that's even with uh, the ai craze um flat industrial production and we have flat gross domestic income in real terms. People don't realize that profits in real terms adjusted for inflation are flat to negative. Uh, so flat production, flat real income, but real GDP over 3%, which is astounding. And that's the number everybody looks at is GDP. What's GDP? GDP is spending. And I guess because we're just uh, all a nation of narcissists that uh, we just focus on the spending side to gauge the economic health of the country. Uh, but production is flat on a 12-month basis, not a one-month basis, not a two- or three-month. Over the past 12 months, production is flat. Real domestic income is flat. But real GDP is up over 3%. And the question is why? What's the difference? Well, the difference is this. production and income are not leveraged. GDP is spending, and that can be leveraged. And that's really what happened last year. Last year, in terms of explaining why GDP was so strong, came down to three things. 
we had the last leg of the excess savings file from the Biden stimulus checks that were mailed out to everybody, uh, as long as you had a pulse back in uh, the uh, winter of 2021. That was a gift that kept on giving. That was a $2 trillion gift that couldn't possibly be spent all at once. That had a lingering impact uh, right through into last year. Uh, and then we had a credit card boom of virtually unprecedented proportions. It was astounding uh, that you would have had double-digit growth in credit card balances uh, at a time when interest rates uh, on these things were well in excess of 20%. And now we're paying the piper because you see that the delinquency rates uh, on credit cards have gone up to the highest level since 2012 when the unemployment rate was 8% not 3.9 percent very interesting massive credit card boom uh the last leg of the excess savings drawdown uh which frankly i wasn't expecting because the uh the research shows that uh when households in america are confronted with a stimulus check in the past they used to spend half and save half uh but it didn't get saved it all got spent uh, I did not think we'd finish the year with the savings rate flirting with around 3.5%. It's less than half the pre-COVID norm. But we become a nation of uh, where acronyms are like YOLO. You know, YOLO, you only live once. YOLO to Main Street is what FOMO is to Wall Street. And then the really big one was the expansion of fiscal policy. I mean, here we had the unemployment rate below 4%. And the government expanded the deficit by 25% last year. That is unheard of. But when you look at the fiscal expansion last year, both directly and indirectly, so indirectly I'm referring to the multiplier impacts on the fiscal expansion, uh, that accounted for two-thirds of that 3% GDP growth last year. And the other third came from the drawdown of the excess savings in the household sector and the spending associated with the credit card boom. So outside of these three developments, actually GDP growth was flat in line with production, in line with income. And people might say, well, you know, that's data mining. I prefer to call it analysis, but only point it out because if I was an equity analyst and I was writing this up like a company report, I put an asterisk and I'd say at the bottom of the page, these are non-recurring items. Um, credit card rejection rates have gone up to near record highs. People are applying for fewer credit cards. Uh, and because the misery right now of having your FICO score affected by the fact that delinquency rates on credit cards uh, have gone up uh, to 12-year highs. Uh, and uh, the excess savings file is now in the rearview mirror. And as far as fiscal policy is con concerned, all we're doing is running fiscal policy right now on a set of continuing resolutions. There is no more fiscal stimulus until possibly after the uh, November election. So you're just taking away the crutches uh, that supported GDP growth last year. They gave you collectively three percentage points of growth. All the growth last year in GDP came from these sources and they're not in existence anymore. And then you're searching for, well, what is the catalyst that's going to cause a reacceleration of the economy? I frankly can't really find one. Right now, everything is breathing the fumes of a soft landing, or some Wall Street analysts are calling it a no landing. So a recession will come as a very big surprise. Uh, the markets are not priced for a contraction in the economy, which would necessarily involve a contraction in earnings. Uh, the stock market right now is operating under really two beliefs. The first is that we have a consensus on Wall Street that we're going to have 11% earnings growth this year. Uh, well, that will not happen if we have a recession. But when you're taking a look at the multiples, I mean, look at um, what is a normalized multiple in a 4 to 4.5% 4 range on the 10-year Treasury note yield historically. So when you look at where the multiple should be based on past performance with interest rates where they are, we should have a 16 multiple as a fair value. This market's not a fair value. Uh, we're at a 21 multiple. Uh, so when you back that out, you know, it's one thing to say, well, the analysts are calling for 11% earnings growth this year.
but the stock market, not the analyst, the stock market is priced for 45% earnings growth. It's the only way you could make the current forward multiple make any sense against the backdrop of the industry landscape that we're in right now. If we were at zero rates or 1% rates or even 1.5% rates, you could build the argument that the multiple should be inflated. But we have multiples right now that are trading as if the risk-free rate is still as bad is back close to zero. No, it hasn't been zero for you know over two years, through three years. So the market itself is de facto discounting 45% earnings growth this year, which has happened in the past. It's not a zero event, it's happened three percent of the time in the past. So call it a one in 30 event, but when you normally get a 45% earnings boom in a year, you're typically coming out of recession, let alone a soft landing, let alone possibly or probably heading into recession. So this market is, uh, you got the analyst saying, we're going to have a, a soft landing that's going to generate 11% growth in earnings. The stock market's saying how it's priced, never mind soft landing. The stock market is priced for an unremittent economic boom. So there you have it. Uh, will a recession upset the apple cart? Of course it will. Again, under the premise that it actually happens. Like I said, it didn't happen last year in the most traditional sense, looking at GDP. Uh, and um, those other metrics I mentioned were flat. They weren't negative. However, you go from positive to flat. Uh, there's still the policy lags to kick in. Where do you go next? So I think that a recession is still my base case scenario. Uh, I'm not throwing in the towel because if I threw in the towel in 2007, uh, I would have looked like an idiot. And a lot of my counterparts on Wall Street look like idiots. People just tend to forget. And of course, if you, you know, so long as you toe the line and, uh, you know, and, you um, uh, you know, if you're a, uh, a bear in a bull market, uh, you'll be forgiven. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're a, a bear in a bull market, you won't be forgiven. But you're a, a bull in a bear market, that's fine. Because uh, these are the things people don't want to talk about. Uh, they don't want to think about. Uh, but if you're managing money for other people, you have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to have a good idea as to where you are in the business cycle. So, uh, yeah, I think that um, looking at, never mind if we get an earnings recession, look where the multiple is right now. Look at the multiples right now. The multiple of 21, forward multiple of 21. It was 18 this time last year. A three-point multiple expansion in a 12-month span. That is a 1 in 10 event. Having a multiple of 21 is a 1 in 10 event. So uh, I just don't think right now the, um, the tailwinds are with you. The math is not with you. An equity risk premium of 50 basis points. The math is not with you. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Dave Rosenberg. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.